uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, whatever time it happens to be for you. I hope that you're safe and healthy. Um, and I thank you for joining me for this talk, which is titled Writing the Neverending Story Without Burning Out. Um, as mentioned, I'm Rebecca Harwick. Uh, I got my start in the game industry 14 years ago, roughly, July 2006. Uh, I began work at BioWare on Star Wars The Old Republic, the MMO, and I worked on that for basically five years, basically until it launched. And then I worked on The Elder Scrolls Online MMO before moving to Germany and taking a little bit of a different um, tack in my career. I joined Wooga, a free-to-play casual game company doing story-driven hidden object games to create one of their new hidden object games. And that game ended up being June's Journey. And as I mentioned in my bio, the thing that sort of ties my whole career together is that all of these games are built um, on the idea of being live games that players return to month after month, year after year. And so they never come to a final conclusion. There's always more stories that can be told in the world. And particularly on June's Journey, we release a chapter of sto a story every week on this game. Um, so it's continually growing. We're continually finding new ways to tell stories. So what is the never ending story? Um, the way I like to describe it, the challenge is to tell a story, create a story that can be told for 10 years. Um, and why would we wanna do that, <laughs> pray tell? Um, well, one of the reasons for us at Wuga is when you look at the free to play space that we're in, games increasingly are not uh, one-off releases that you play and then they end and players drift away after maybe a year or so of playing, um, they are now uh, essentially platforms. They are, these games can run for 10 years and can continually reinvent themselves through new mechanics, new events, um, through uh, entirely new features. And one of the questions we ask ourselves is why isn't story more of a part of that? Um, story does a lot for games. We're big fans of the idea of, of how stories elevate the game mechanics and give meaning to the play experience and introduce you to a world of characters and situations that um, build your relationship with the game, give you a real emotional arc, help you learn empathy with the world, and just add this entirely new dimension of, of, of play to games. And yet it's still a pretty new thing in this space to tell stories. But we think that that can be a major part of why players come back to these games week after week, month after month, year after year for 10 years. And as writers in general, I think we should care about this because when you look at the story-driven games market, there are a, a few main directions that are out there right now. Um, the smaller studios and the indie studios will still release these self-contained story projects. Um, but as you get into bigger and bigger games, you see this need to fill a game with lots of different stories, with lots of content in order to keep players engaged for a long time, in order to justify the huge cost of making these games. And in the free-to-play space as well, you see um, story being explored through apps like Pixelberry's Choices, which uses a library of stories, lots and lots of different stories to keep people coming back. But whether you're working on one of these games in this space, or whether you are working on a, a self-contained game, I think there's a solid craft reason to think about the never-ending story and what it means for your craft and what it means for your team. Because it's really about creating a tool set that you can use to tell theoretically infinite stories, to create a world and a cast of characters that are big enough that players want to keep playing in that space and they want to learn more about those characters. And it drives their interest, their curiosity, their sense of wonder and discovery and surprise and delight in your world, which is the foundation of great storytelling whether you're telling a single story or whether you're telling um, many stories in a serialized fashion over the course of many years. 
And as I mentioned, I was lead writer on a hidden object game at Wooga that came to be June's Journey. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the things we learned over the years doing this kind of storytelling. I'm gonna be talking about some of the choices that I made um, with the team on uh, when creating the story for June's Journey and, and, and deciding how we would approach building a game that could have this lifespan. And so I wanna give you a little bit of information about June's Journey in case you're not familiar with it so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's a story-driven hidden object detective game. And you play, it's set in the 1920s, and you play as amateur detective June Parker. She solves mysteries by finding clues and hidden object scenes and by solving puzzles, adventure game style puzzles, manipulating objects and inventory items. It had its global launch in October 2017. It soft launched earlier that year. And since then, we have released over 150 chapters, a uh, chapter a week for basically three years. And we're continuing to tell new stories in this world. We're continuing to release chapters and players keep coming to the game. It's a, it's a growing game right now, even three years in. And it wasn't Wuga's first foray into this I concept of the never ending story. Wuga had previously released a hidden object game called Pearl's Peril, um, which also used story to drive the action of the game and give meaning to the hidden object mechanics that players were playing with. Um, it, it was a very light story layer, and it was really one of among the first free to play games to really have big success telling a story. We stopped telling stories, new stories on Pearl's Peril after 90 chapters, but it is such a popular part of the game, such an essential part of the game for players, that what happens is when players reach the end of those 90 chapters, um, many of them reset and play those 90 chapters all over again. Um, some of them have done it four or five times. At the time I was joining Wooga, they were also getting ready to launch another story-driven hidden object game called Agent Alice. And again, this was on the weekly chapter model, but they made some different decisions from Pearl's Peril, where Pearl's Peril had told a continuous story over those 90 chapters with cliffhangers and interesting mysteries that uh, extended over multiple chapters. Agent Alice went for a much more episodic feel. Each chapter was self-contained. And Agent Alice wasn't very successful. And there, you could do an entire talk on why Agent Alice didn't succeed. Uh, but we learned so, the very hard way, some very real challenges that come with the idea of doing this never ending storytelling, this serialized years long storytelling. Um, the first thing was with it, the first learnings were, were, came from, came, were focused on craft, right? We're focused on some of the decisions. Uh, why did players get bored with the chapters in Agent Alice? Why did they find them repetitive and predictable? Um, but the second and, and I'd say arguably more important lesson we learned was about team health and how to make sure that when you're building these games, you're scoping appropriately to your team size, to your team's seniority level and skill level, and uh, also making sure that your team isn't burning out creating these stories because when you launch a game like this, you're not, you're not, whew, we're done, we can relax, sit back, enjoy the ride. It, that's, um, you know, arguably when the real work begins because you're going to be releasing that chapter every week and your team needs to be able to do that. And then if, if there is something wrong with the game, if there is a need to pivot and make changes, your team can't be already at capacity just getting that chapter out. They need to be able to be flexible. They need to be able to react. Um, and so we have to think about both the craft side of things and the team health side of things. And that's why this talk has these two parts. Um, if you think about telling the never ending story, creating a story that can be told for 10 years as trying to cross this mountain range, um, you need a couple of things going into this. You need more than a couple of things, honestly, but you need to have the right plan, the right toolkit to take you over this mountain range. And that's kind of the craft part of this talk. That's the, the metaphor I'm using here. And you also need the right people and the ability to take care of those people to get you across that mountain range. You're not gonna do it all alone. So I'm gonna start with the craft. <laughs> 
And I want to talk first of all about, you know, what makes stories great? Why do we come to them? Why do we enjoy them? What makes a really memorable story? And I think when I talk to people about this, and I ask this question to people a lot because I'm talking to writers all the time for our teams. Um, and one of the key things that comes up is, is mystery. Um, and that's not, oh, there's a murder and there's a mystery to solve, but just the idea that a story starts with, with some sort of question, some sort of puzzle, some sort of, well, for lack of a better word, mystery. It sparks, it sparks curiosity. It makes, it makes me want to know more about what's going to happen here. What is going on here? Um, the other one that comes up a ton is surprise. I think that's probably the one that people mention the most. The stories I love best are the ones that found a way to surprise me. That might be a twist. That might be in how it's told. That might be in how it entertained me with humor or moved me with emotion. But there's a surprise in there that makes this story distinct, that makes it stand out from other stories I might have read that had similar setups or were in a similar genre. And stories also have, great stories also have satisfying resolution. They tie up their themes. They finish their character arcs in a way that feels fitting to that character's journey. Um, they answer those initial questions um, in some fashion uh, that, it, that, that, that people find satisfying. And so you can see how this idea of, of what makes a story great can be challenging when you set out to tell one that can last for 10 years. Because how do you, how do you avoid bloating your world building and your lore, introducing so many of these interesting questions and answering so many of them in interesting ways that it becomes impossible for a new person to enter the story. I think about, you know, the X-Men comics and trying to figure out when I was a kid what the Siege Perilous was. Um, it can lead to confusion and it could be off-putting for someone who's joining the story um, not from the beginning. Uh, the rep or, or who has stepped away from it and needs to come back to it and they need to remember everything. Um, when you're telling a story that long, it would be easy to fall into patterns of, of repeating yourself. And that was one of the problems we had on Agent Alice is it very quickly became repetitious and predictable. And so people lost interest in what was going on in the narrative there. Um, and you can end up in a place where, well, we're telling a never ending story, right? So that means we never end. So so people start getting frustrated. Players start wonder, are you, are you, is this a bait and switch? You're never going to answer these questions. You're never going to give me a sense of accomplishment or resolution. You're never going to deliver on the themes, the promises that you make with your characters. And all of that is really deadly to a good story. So I had this in mind when I was talking to the team and when the team and I were setting down to figure out what should we do to tell a story this long? How should we do it? And fortunately, this isn't completely uh, unexplored territory. We have forebears, um, some in games, but also a lot in other media. And so we started by doing our research. We started by looking at specifically other media that we knew our audience consumes. So the free-to-play hidden object audience is largely middle-aged women and older. Um, and so we looked at shows, long-running television shows like Grey's Anatomy that have managed to reinvent themselves and revive themselves across cast changes and multiple seasons. We looked at mystery fiction. Our audience are huge consumers of mystery fiction. They are voracious readers. Um, and these long running mystery series like Sue Grafton's um, alphabet books were a great inspiration for us. And then I looked a little further afield. Um, I've mentioned comic books already. I think comic books have a lot to teach us about the best practices of this kind of storytelling and the pitfalls because you, know, you think about X-Men which started in the 1960s, it's been going for close to, to 60 years now. Um, so there's a lot we can learn about how to build a universe that can last beyond any one writing team from comics. And what we took away, the three observations that we, key observations that we took away from looking at these references is one that if you wanna tell a long lasting story, you need a robust story engine. You need a way of generating 
lots of stories within your world. Two, that in the long run, what keeps people coming back isn't any one particular plot, but to spend time with characters that they love and to see how they struggle and grow and change and how their relationships deepen. Uh, and three, uh, perhaps paradoxically, the key to writing the never ending story is to in fact write endings. Um, and so I'm gonna dig into each of these three things in a little bit more detail now starting with story engines. What's a story engine? Well, it answers the question, why does your main character keep getting into trouble? Um, you can always come up with bespoke answers to this question with um, carefully detailed reasons to set off a plot. But if you have a story engine there humming in the background, you don't have to spend as much time justifying and setting up conflict and you can focus more on the character development. Um, we identified a few different types of story engines, and we're, we didn't invent this term, by the way. It's been used in television. It's been used in game writing before. Um, but we identified a few um, really common, really effective types of story engines and some of their strengths and weaknesses. So the first one of these, probably the, the most common one across the board, across media, is the job, right? So Meredith Gray in Grey's Anatomy is a doctor. Geralt of Rivia is a monster hunter. Commander Shepard is a space soldier. And that immediately tells you very intuitively why these characters get mixed up in various problems and situations. Because there's a monster to hunt or there's a surgery to be performed. And you don't need to come up with a justification for why Meredith Grey is performing surgery week after week because it's her job. They're also great for games, this job story engine, because it's action oriented. It implies that there's a set of things that the character does, and that can translate well to mechanics. The downside of the job story engine is that it can lack an emotional hook. Um, most people are not super passionately attached to their jobs. There, there's not a lot emotionally at stake for them per se, except you know, that they want to, to be successful and put food on the table. And of course, a job can become repetitious um, if all you do is the same, say, appendectomy over and over again in your doctor game. Um, you're going to get start getting bored. So, the next type of story engine I want to talk about is also very common, less so in games, I would say, although there are a few really good examples. Um, the next story engine I call the journey. And it is, think of, think of Odysseus in the Odyssey returning to Ithaca. And along the way, he encounters all kinds of problems, has all kinds of misadventures. His goal never changes. His goal is to get home. But all of the obstacles on the way create interesting stories because they're, they're interfering with him achieving this main goal. And we see this really well done in you know, the game 80 Days based on the book around the world in 80 days. And we see it well done in Kentucky Route Zero where you're trying to reach this address to make this one last delivery and you get waylaid, you get sidetracked and you have all kinds of adventures. And so it's great because like the job, there's, there's sort of an intuitive clear set of problems to solve. It's, well, this isn't my destination. So how do I get out of this place and on to the next place? How do I get closer to my destination? Um, what it adds that the job doesn't necessarily do is the opportunity to center a lot of different stories. It's really good for vignette style storytelling. And so you can have stories that put lots of different characters at the center. You can have characters who join on the journey, who take over the journey as happens at times in Kentucky Route Zero. So it's not tied to your protagonist as strongly as other uh, story engines might be. But the downside is that the storytelling can start to feel a little disjointed if you're not careful about tying your themes together. It can start to feel like you're just constantly moving from one distraction to the next rather than doing something meaningful towards your in-game goals. And we expect the journey to end. It would be very frustrating to play a game where the goal is to reach a place and instead of the story ever giving you a chance of letting you reach a place. And this is different from if you say fail in 80 days, right? Um, 
or if the point of the story is that you didn't need to reach that place to begin with, that's, that's a structured authorial choice. It's still a resolution. Whereas if you're writing the never ending story and you, you provide that resolution, now you still need a new story engine. So another example of a story engine that we looked at is the personal quest. So you have um, you know, someone like Lincoln Clay on a quest for revenge, or you have uh, Aloy on her quest for personal uh, fulfillment, uh, for what is her place in the world, for an answer to her identity. And the personal quest is great uh, because it gives you this strong emotional hook. Um, Players immediately, you know, start to relate to what's at stake for the character, and it's it's a much stronger drive to engage in the story than a job is, for example. Um, and that strong emotional hook brings a lot of character growth potential. When a character really, really wants something, that's a real opportunity to put them through the ringer to test how far they're willing to go to learn who they are to test their relationships in the context of them achieving their goals. And that can make for some really compelling storytelling. But it does require setup. Um, and each time you know, a personal quest is resolved, because you do want to resolve the personal quest, you then either have to introduce a new story engine, or you have to set up a new personal quest with a new setup, a new hook. And that can have diminishing returns. So, the fourth story engine that we looked at is probably the weakest of them. I call it, it's just the character. The character gets in trouble because the character gets in trouble. That's who they are. That's what they do. So Kazuma Kiryu in the Yakuza series, he just likes being a good person. He, he cannot say no to someone who needs help. Um, and he has that kind of naive openness about the world where everyone is just in need of a helping hand and the world would be a better place. And superheroes are kind of like this too. Um, you could say it's a job, but Spider-Man doesn't really have a boss. Spider-Man is driven by his sense of personal responsibility and the fact that you know, he can't set boundaries for himself. And so the great thing about this character story engine is that it's always ongoing. As long as the character has those traits, um, you can come up with reasons for them to get involved in a wealth of things. But it can feel like a stretch at times, even then. Why is Kazuma Kiryu, in the middle of this Yakuza plot, uh, getting a toy out of a crane game for a kid? Um, and it can be a limiter on character growth. Spider-Man might briefly decide that it's not worth it anymore to be Spider-Man, but eventually he's got to return to the costume, return to the job, because otherwise there's no Spider-Man story. Um, and the same is true of Kiryu. He's not gonna, you're not gonna have a character who can participate in side quests if Kiryu suddenly decides to become jaded or cynical about the world. So what do we do on June's journey then for a story engine? Well, as I've sort of suggested, each of them has their strengths and each of them has things that, that maybe pose a problem if you wanna tell a story that doesn't end. And so we mixed and matched. Um, we start with a personal quest because that gives us our immediate emotional hook. June's sister has been killed. She has to solve the murder and she has to take care of her niece also who's been orphaned by this event. And so that creates a whole interesting set of problems for June as a character to solve. We also gave June the sort of character that would make her want to be involved, uh, especially if something is, it appears to her to be wrong. In fact, it's, it even becomes a character flaw for her, where there are numerous stories in the game where people say, you need to butt out of this, and she doesn't listen, and there are consequences because she's a little bit too headstrong, a little bit too sure of that, that, that she knows what's right um, compared to everyone else. And as the stories continue, and we did continue to introduce some personal quests here and there as we worked on her character and fleshed it out. Um, we also discovered that, you know, as June solved more mysteries, she gained some notoriety within the world and people would come to her and contact her and want her help. And that could pull her into a new story as an amateur sleuth uh, being brought into a job by someone at the end of their rope. 
And so in that sense, we started to introduce the idea that this was also partly a job. Oddly enough, for a game called June's Journey, we use Journey very rarely, very sparingly. Um, we tend to use it on the chapter level. Um, so an individual chapter versus an entire story arc will be about um, the difficulty of getting someplace in the 1920s and the misadventure June has along the way. And part of the reason for that is because we have, we have a pretty generous character budget for um, the level of detail in our characters, but it's very difficult for us to introduce the kind of cast of characters that would be required for proper vignette style storytelling. So once we had our story engine, that, that wasn't enough, right? The story engine is the thing that runs in the background. It buzzes along, generating some new conflict for your characters, but it's not enough to sustain interest or surprise. If you let it go on its own, it's going to eventually lead to repetition, predictability, boredom. And we, as we said, those are deadly to good storytelling. Um, so what we had observed is that characters drive people to come back to the game. And so we resolved that even though we would have these twisty mystery plots, what was really gonna drive the long-term story was our characters and their growth. And this is for June who um, has to work on all kinds of issues. Um, her fear of abandonment and commitment, her belief that she always knows best, her rush to judge people in her lives who make different choices from her. She has a host of things that she needs to grow and develop in. But also for our supporting cast, our non-player characters, it's really important to give them a strong sense of agency and character arcs of their own over the course of the story. Um, so you, you can take, for example, Virginia, who starts out as this traumatized teenager who's lost her parents starts to grow up into an independent young woman, but also starts to diverge a bit from June and June's desired influence on her in key ways. For example, June um, abhors violence and Virginia is a little bit more radicalized, a little bit more willing to use violence to achieve what she sees as just aims. And that creates interesting conflict as the story develops, uh, both at the beginning when June is trying to help support this teenager who's in a, in a troubled state, state and as their relationship changes. Um, it's a real pitfall to this kind of storytelling, a real temptation to not trust your characters to grow and change, to think, well, if they grow, then they'll solve all their problems and there'll be no more conflict and there'll be no more story. I mean, that's what happens in sitcoms all the time. We have, we have to have Fraser Crane screwing up his personal relationships, otherwise there's no humor to be had. Um, but that's not the reality of how characters or people grow and change. Um, anytime that people sort of reflect on themselves and try to change something about themselves, they might succeed at it. They might succeed at doing that, but create problems in other areas. They might improve their lives and find that their friends and family don't understand it, don't like this direction that they've gone in and reject them. And so there's always new opportunities to see how characters, relationships develop and deepen as a result of character growth. And the other thing is that it can be tempting sometimes as writers to undo a character's growth. Um, and this happened recently in Grey's Anatomy, one of the shows we looked at as reference, um, where a lot of fans were upset about how the character of Alex Karev was written off the show because to them it appeared that the writers had just abandoned about 10 years of character development and growth in order to give him what they saw as sort of the fairy tale ending. And uh, I'm not saying that characters can't backslide. Char characters absolutely can backslide. But as writers, we need to be careful to earn that. And we shouldn't leave the opportunity to earn that on the table. That's really interesting storytelling to explore what would catalyze someone into changing their behavior for, for the worse um, into undoing years of growth that they had. Um, to be fair to the writers of Grey's Anatomy, they seem to be in a little bit of a pickle try, trying to write off a character whose actor had decided to leave the show. So how do we handle this character growth? How do we make sure that we're honoring it as we tell the story? 
How do we take advantage of all the different relationships that are possible between characters to let them drive our story? Well, we, we use the character matrix and this, this graphic is from one of our um, uh, match three games, Tropic Cats, uh, but it's, it's just as valuable in any of our games to take a sheet and put our characters into it and describe what their relationships are. How does this character respond to this other character? Um, and this doesn't just happen at the beginning of the game when we're creating the initial set of relationships and story. This is the kind of thing that kind of exercise that applies each time we go into a story arc. It's worthwhile for us to go and look at the characters involved and, and look at has something about them changed that would cause their relationships to change and that would make for an interesting story. And this is also a great way for us to find characters who maybe are in different spheres of June's life and wouldn't ordinarily interact. So for example, on June's journey, we had these two very minor characters from entirely different spheres of June's life. Miss Hillingdon, the headmistress from Virginia school and Sonny Daggett, a New Jersey pharmacist with ties to or organized crime. And as we were looking at these characters and how they might interact, we thought it would be, we, we realized that, that they might make a really odd, but really sweet couple. Um, and so we wrote an arc because you know, we were coming down off of a very high stakes story. We need something to give the players a breather and have a little bit of fun with our characters. So we wrote an arc about um, these two and how they get, June gets wrapped up in a case for one of them and they end up meeting uh, through a sort of series of coincidences and they end up falling in love with each other. Um, and we had a lot of fun writing this as writers, but it was also really popular with players. So, you know, a few chapters later, chapter 100, we were teasing a wedding and players, of course, wanted June to get married. But um, their next hope when they when they thought that maybe it wouldn't be June getting married. Was that it would be Miss Hillingdon and Sonny Daggett. They were a, a fan favorite couple and still are. So that brings us to the third thing that we observed from our research and thinking about how we were gonna structure June's journey. We wanted to write endings. We wanted to regularly pay off promises that we made to the players as a way of earning and keeping their trust. And how do we do that while keeping the story going while still making it so that there's an interesting next thing? Um, well, we took a page here from comic books. So we took some inspiration there. So comic books often tell stories in story arcs. They'll have a, a few issues that cover one story. So maybe it'll be three issues, maybe it'll be five or six. Um, and those issues will tell one complete story. And there'll be cliffhangers that encourage you to pick up the next part of the story. And we thought that was a good chunk for us as well. Um, that would allow us to for example, in six chapters, we solve the mystery of who killed June's sister, Claire. Um, and that, by using these story arcs, we could in introduce new, fresh mysteries. We could resolve those mysteries, ensure that the player always had an answer. But then also, between story arcs, we could continue to do this long-term development of character and thematic arcs. So the first four story arcs of June's journey, for example, are about June's relationship to motherhood. So she never chose to be a mother, but now she's an aunt who needs to take care of her niece. And so the first four story arcs deal with her relationship with Virginia, her role as a new mother to Virginia, her relationship to the mothers in her own life, her biological mother who abandoned her, and the woman who cared for her through much of her adolescence, Mrs. Talbot. Um, and in that way, using the character and her conflicted feelings about motherhood, we have a through line that connects these arcs, a connective tissue. And yet we can still give the player the payoff they want, the, the feeling of a satisfactory resolution. And that's the layering that we did. Um, the other advantage of this is it lets us, it drives us away from over-reliance on raising the stakes over and over and over again. Um, we, because we don't commit to telling just one story, we don't have to go, uh, we don't have to constantly raise the amount of pressure on our characters. We don't have to create this stressful experience of, well, 
uh, first the turkey caught on fire, now the house, now the town, or, you know, oh, you know, the, the, there's always a, a bigger fish, a bigger conspiracy. I thought this person killed Claire, but it turns out he was hired by this person who was working for this worldwide conspiracy. We don't have to do this kind of, um, there's always a bigger fish thing. Instead, what we can do is we can bring an end, a satisfying end to an exciting high stakes arc. And then we can vary up our pacing. We can vary up the intensity of our storytelling and we can give players something more fun like the Miss Hillingdon and Sonny Daggett story. And this experience also helps keep the story surprising. So the pacing isn't always the same. Uh, it helps us do a variety of stories, which helps us stay interested in telling the story and helps us flex our creativity. And it ensures that players aren't dealing with just a constantly rising tension that leaves the story with nowhere to go. So that was the craft part of the talk. No less important is the team part of the talk. How do we take care of our teams while writing the never ending story? And to do this, I'm gonna put up a picture of someone I don't like very much and I apologize. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Patriots fan. I, I don't actually follow the NFL anymore. Um, and, uh, but Bill Belichick is known in the NFL for doing something that I think is valuable to us, um, which is that he thinks tactically about his teams and his game plans. And that's the only thing I will say good about Bill Belichick, I promise. Um, so what he does is he fits his game plan to the team he's playing against and to the personnel he can put on the field. And the same is true for us when we're thinking about telling a story week after week after week. What do we release week after week after week? What is that chapter? And the best plan for the scope of that, for the complexity of that is the one that fits the team you have. What if you don't have a team? Well, then it's a little trickier. Then you have to play a balancing act. So what are the staffing considerations? How do you know how many people it's gonna to take to do this week after week after week? There are a few different things we need to look at. We need to look at scope. Obviously, the more you plan to release in a week, the bigger the chapter, uh, the more people you're gonna to need to produce it. You also have to look at frequency of releases. So if you were to release 5,000 or say 4,000 words, and word count is not the whole story by any means, but if you were to write four, release 4,000 words of content of story, in a month, you would have to do handoffs for that month. If you were to release that instead 1,000 words at a time each week for a month, you'd have to be doing handoffs and briefs and alignment with different disciplines each week and chapter testing each week. And so the frequency of releases does slow you down. And that is a consideration that you need to make when you're doing this. Team size is also a little bit tricky. Adding a writer doesn't necessarily increase the amount that you can write by you know, that factor, right? Um, so if you have a four person writing team, add another, adding another writer doesn't necessarily make you um, 25 or 20% 20 more effective because now you have to align with that writer. Your more senior team members and your lead have to help manage that member, have to help give feedback to that member. And so, yes, you will get more writing out of a bigger team, but the individuals in that team will move slower than they would. And so you have to balance that trade-off and think about whether it's worth reducing scope versus raising team size. It can also be much harder to hit consistent quality with a bigger team. And then of course, the seniority level of your team is a factor when you're picking your scope and when you're thinking these things through because you know a more senior team can probably produce higher quality faster, but they might tend to pull in different directions a little bit. And a more junior team will take longer to get to a consistent quality and will require more time from your seniors feedbacking on them. And so you need to strike a good balance where you're giving people a chance to learn and grow in the craft as juniors but you're also 
making sure that your seniors aren't overtasked with feedbacking them. So then what are you releasing? Um, what's really key to releasing consistent chapters we found at WUGA is that the more you can reduce the variables in what you're releasing, the better off you are. The more consistently a chapter looks like a previous chapter in structure, in what are the art assets that it requires, in how many, you know, what is the word count you're gonna be delivering, the more stable you can make that, the easier it is for you to build a consistent pipeline for a regular release. Now within that, you still have a great deal of flexibility about what kind of stories you can tell. Um, it's not that each chapter should feel the same in terms of pacing or in terms of the intensity or the stakes or the excitement, but having a stable structure, especially an agreement between disciplines of how much art you're going to produce helps you build something like this, um, which is your pipeline, which is how different aspects of the story get handed off to different disciplines at different times. And the key thing about this chapter definition, say you're doing a weekly chapter, it doesn't mean that this entire process needs to fit into a week. What it means is that you need to be able to hand off enough of this process in parallel, that if, it, if the whole length of the process is, say, nine weeks long, at week nine, after starting the process, you get chapter one, at week 10, you get chapter two, at week 11, you get chapter three, and so forth. Um, but that's why having a really clear definition of what you're handing off and when and how much it's going to be is important because each discipline needs to understand what they're going to be expected to deliver in a week. And then they need to be able to staff and to scope accordingly. <clears throat> so on June's journey, to again get back to a concrete example, we had a team of fairly junior writers. We knew that the Agent Alice scope had been too much um, in terms of word count. So we scaled back, but we still wanted to go beyond what Pearl's Peril had done. We still wanted to tell a story with a lot more depth. Um, but we also knew that we had a seasoned art team that was really good at making HO scenes and a design team that could design good adventure scenes. So we included those, even though those are very intensive parts of the June's journey process. Making five beautiful HO scenes a week is a big process. It's a lot of work. Um, we also had a end of chapter cutscene, and we have the 10 clues that are used to advance the story. For the writing team, it ends up being around 1,500 words a week with additional features and some support for um, some support for naming hidden objects and naming decorative items in the game, um, which isn't a lot, or it doesn't seem like a lot. Um, it was a team of three writers for most of production. We had four at the very beginning. It doesn't seem like a lot, but there's a thing to keep in mind about your team's velocity and your pace. Um, you have to think about it like running. So runners have a mile pace, which is how fast they can run a mile if all they have to do is run that mile. And then they have a 5K pace, which is how fast they can run each mile if they have to run 3.11 miles. And then they'll have a maybe a 10K pace or a, or a half marathon or marathon pace, depending if, you know, if they run these longer runs. And it's an understanding that when you have to keep something in the tank for later, you can't go all out on that first mile. You're not going to be able to sustain it. You need a sustainable pace the longer you plan to run. Um, and the same is true of writing, which is not so physically demanding, but is certainly mentally demanding. What you can write in a week when you just have to write for that week versus what you can produce consistently week after week after week after week for a month is different. And the same is true week after week after week for a year. And you'll have some chapters you find that are just tough, that just take longer to make, and some chapters that go by like a breeze. And so it really takes some time. You have to spend time figuring out your pacing. But of course, you can't figure out your pacing until you know how, plan you far, how far you plan to run, which is why this, the clear de chapter definition is so fundamental. Um, how do you find that pace? 
Well, I like to work with the producers on the writing teams at WUGA on burn down charts. And writers usually, uh, they get a little, a little uh, nervous around the burn down chart when we introduce it. Um, but in every case where we've used it so far, the response after using it has been extremely positive from the writing teams. And that's because of how we use it. The goal is to get to a good estimate of how long it takes. And not how long it takes to do once, but how long it takes to do one, two, three, four, five times, six times, seven times. And so what ends up happening, why the writers like it, um, is that they see that, ah, oh, this one chapter that was really hard that took me much longer than I thought it should have. They see if that's the exception or the rule. And if it's the rule, then we have to adjust the estimates or we have to adjust the scope or we have to adjust the staffing. But then we can respond to it. We can do something about it. And they're not stuck sitting there going, oh, I can't finish this on time and I have to work extra for it and it's killing me and I feel bad. Um, or they find that it's the exception and that other chapters go much faster. And then it also feels better because they realize, okay, if a chapter is tough, sometimes that happens, but it'll get made up somewhere else and it's fine. The other thing that's really beneficial for, I find, is discovering hidden work. Suddenly, when you have to actually keep track of how long it's taking you to complete a task, you're very aware of the things that come up throughout the day that distract you. And again, there are things that we can do to address this. Do these things come up because there are things that just need to be done regularly? And can we plan ahead for them better and work them into, the, into this content plan, this chapter plan that we're building? Or you know, are they really necessary? Is there a way to streamline them or eliminate them or make the communication clearer so that they're, they're not coming up? And so it removes this, this hidden work element. But you have to do it for a while. You can't run it for one week because, again, you need to get that sense of what the long-term pacing is. And you want to get this as early as possible. You want to have this chapter definition and this idea of a burn down um, in pre-production, ideally, so that when you're entering production, what you're doing is you're just working at getting up to that pace and getting that pipeline up and running and building a buffer as well because a buffer is going to keep you from hitting a wall where if a chapter is late, you're in trouble. Um, you can't ship one. It also allows your team to take holidays, which is a good segue to this next slide, which is about, you know, this is, there's, there are ways to structure the work to keep from burning out that are very important, but we also need to think beyond the work. Anyone, even working sustainably on a story for weeks and weeks and weeks, for years and years, is gonna start to hit a sort of creative stagnation. They're gonna to start to get tired of it. They're going to have trouble being excited and inspired by it usually. Um, at WUGA, we're fortunate that we're a multi-project studio. So we can always move people to a new project uh, after a couple of years. And it gives them something fresh, fresh challenges to solve, fresh problems to solve. But if you don't have a multi-project studio, um, I really recommend doing game jams or regular game prototyping or feature jams for your game where you're thinking, what would be cool to have? Maybe it doesn't make it onto the list of things that you add to the game. I'm not proposing that we blow up scope, but spending some time where you think about what would be nice to have and how would you do it? How would you solve various narrative problems? Or what could the next game be? Um, it can be a good way to switch gears, to refresh your brain, to, again, deal with a different set of problems than you're dealing in the day-to-day, week-to-week release of a content chapter. Workshops are really popular with my teams. Um, they absolutely love the chance to share work that isn't work-related work. And I love to participate in them too. It's, it's a great way, again, to refresh your creativity, to take your mind off of the weekly story releases. And then, of course, there are ways that have nothing to do with work, per se. Team events um, are a good thing. Uh, 
especially, you know, once you can go out again as a team, but, um, you know, lately with, with the pandemic situation, we've been doing, um, we've been streaming games with each other and, uh, you know, commenting on them and discussing them and picking them apart and, and, you know, making fun of them when they deserve it. Uh, <laughs> it's a good crowd and it's a good way to bond. And it's a good way again, to, to just take inspiration, to get out of, um, the normal day-to-day -day work. We also do research projects periodically at WUGA where people will step off their project and for two weeks just work on exploring a new mechanic or exploring uh, a new genre just to get into the space of what are, what are competitors doing, what is our audience interested in, what kind of mechanic could work well in a story-driven game at WUGA. Um, and again, it's a way to just refresh, to reset, to think in a different space for a while. And last, but definitely not least, time off. Time off needs to be built into your schedule. It's why you need a buffer. Uh, people need to be able to take their time off. Um, again, at Wuga, we're very fortunate. We're in Germany, so we get um, 25 days of time off a year. And I very much encourage my people to take it. Um, I, I don't want anyone burning out and rest is very key to that. So I could go on <laughs> forever probably about this. Um, I could say more about the craft. I could say more about the team, about the role that tools play, for example, in helping our teams be more effective about how best to collaborate with other disciplines when you're turning over a chapter a week. Um, but this talk would go on all day and I don't think you want that. So I'll just say two more things about where the future of the never ending story is for us at Wuga. Um, so one of the things that we've run into with June's journey in particular is that if you started playing here in October, 2017, you started with, you know, essentially a good, a good amount of story there, but, um, an anthill compared to what you have today. And so the person who started in October, 2017 has grown with us as, um, followed the story as it was released and, you know, they're near the end of content or they're at the end of story um, that has been released. Uh, while someone who starts today has this whole big mountain to climb and they're a long way away from seeing chapter 150. Um, and so when we release a new chapter, it, it sort of divides the community right now because some players are eagerly awaiting that chapter and they want to talk about it and they're excited about it. And a lot of players, even more players are just nowhere near that chapter and they want to avoid spoilers. And so uh, what we would like to explore in the future in June's journey is how can we make chapters part of this live ops, part of this thing that brings the community together to discuss the game, because it is a really popular part of the game. It is something that people get excited to discuss, but it's hard for them to discuss right now the way we release chapters in a linear fashion. Of course, there are challenges to solve there, how to make sure that if you come in in the middle, you're not lost. But uh, it's an exciting set of challenges, and I'm hoping that you know maybe next year or or the year after I'll have a lot to say about that. The other thing we're looking at, June's journey was a a very linear story. Um, we're looking at how we can bring player choice into the never-ending story. Now there are great um, there are mobile games out there, great mobile games out there like Pixelberry's Choices, like the late great Storyscapes that have done player choice in this fashion. Uh, but they all, ha all of their stories do eventually end. And so they can, they can know how long they're gonna carry choices forward. If we're telling stories that don't end, that are always gonna generate new stories, we have to ask ourselves, if we're telling a story for 10 years, how long do we hold on to these choices? Is a player gonna remember something or care about something that they chose five years ago? Um, and if we're holding on to these choices for a while, how much are we gonna to have to write once we have five years of choices or even two years worth of choices to um, reflect back to the player and to demonstrate the consequences of. So we've got some clever ideas there. We've got some very clever teams working on this problem. Um, and again, I had something that I hope that um, we'll be able to share more about in the future. So in other words, the, the, the never ending story, the story of the never ending story is also never ending. It's, it's to be continued. We're always looking to push 
the quality bar and the ambition of what we're doing further and to but to do so in a way that is sustainable for our teams that keeps our people healthy and doing their best creative work um, so that said uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk i'm at the linspeed on twitter my website is www.rharwick.com and i'll link the slides there um, and I just wanted to say at this time, I hope you're staying healthy. I hope you're staying safe. And I hope you're staying tireless in the fight for justice and for equal justice um, before the law and to protect especially black lives because black lives matter. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, there has been, there is much applause in the, uh, in the Twitch chat and I can now uh, relay questions. <laughs> Uh, please proceed your question with the word question so that it's easier for me to see. Uh, Swell Mel is asking, uh, wants to hear more about the tools that you mentioned. Yeah, uh, the very, very brief answer is that it's critical if you're gonna release chapters this quickly that you have tools that feel natural for the writers to write in. So they're not fighting against them. They're not playing around with diagrams and things like that. They can just get in their keys and write dialogue. Um, it's really important that you have great tools for um, sharing information between disciplines. Um, and it is also critical that those tools allow um, writers, artists, designers, the whole team to get in and test the content as early as possible. Um, one thing that we wrestled with for a long time on June's journey and we're still working to solve, in fact, is is um, the moods and expressions of characters where we have to request them uh, well in advance of the story being created. And then we, when we set them up in game currently, we can't see them until um, uh, quite a while later, what they look like. And so we end up having to do a lot of last minute tweaking to make sure that they match the lines and that they're appropriate. Um, and we've worked to solve that with an in-house writing tool that our new projects use. And we're working on solutions also for June's Journey, but since June's Journey uses a different system, it's a little bit more complicated. What are some tips that you would give to beginning writers trying to get into a larger writer's room? I guess that's a uh, specifically, question. specifically in games? Sure. Okay. Um, so when, when I'm hiring writers, what I'm looking for, and when I'm, when I'm looking at junior writers in particular, someone who's just starting out, um, I'm looking for someone who shows um, a real spark of originality to their voice. Um, so it's very important that, it, uh, the, the, that when I'm reading like a dialogue sample that there's um, some spark of personality to it, some ambition to it, some sense of this person trying to do something creative with the prompt. And that's true of the tests in general. Um, when, when I, on the occasions when I do do a writing test. Um, I'm also looking for someone who is thinking about how um, character and character action and game mechanics can all work together to create a story. So I'm not interested in uh, you know, dialogue that's just a character talking about themselves and, and telling you who they are, but I'm interested in how the character's actions in the game um, inform the player about who they are and how you can structure a scene out of the conflict between um, the player character and that character, even if it's a minor conflict. It doesn't have to be a big uh, life or death thing. It can be um, you know, for example, early in June's journey, we have a whole plot about how Virginia is skipping school. Does your uh, team work, well, normally, does your team work online or in the office? And if in the office, how have you handled uh, transitioning to remote? Yeah, so we typically, we, we're all based in Berlin. And so we were all working in writer's rooms in the office. Um, we obviously stopped doing that. Um, and 
as far as the transition goes, um, I'd say there's a deeply human uh, factor in the in the transition where some people can handle the isolation um, and some people find it very, very stressful. And in general, not being regularly interacting with each other can be a challenge for that because people feel, even though they're dealing with the same struggles, they feel isolated. And so one of our, our key challenges was just initially just finding a way to make sure that teams connected. And so we did this through a regular coffee hour books throughout the day. We did this through um, goofy Slack prompts, like, you know, every morning someone will post something like, what are your favorite video game soundtracks? And it just gives people a reason to first thing in the morning, pop in, say hi, mingle, compare notes on things. Um, in terms of the actual writer's room work, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate to live at a time when the tools are available to us that um, have made it fairly painless, I would say, from talking to my leads and from sitting in on the virtual writer's rooms. So we can use Google Meets and we can use Miro. I ran a writing workshop last week with um, my teams uh, using Google, Google Meets and Miro that uh, largely worked. I think I might've used uh, Zoom in the future just to get some of the small group discussions that I normally run in the workshops. But these tools are, are, have been really helpful uh, because it, it does largely help us replace what we would have done in the writer's room with a virtual setup. And we're still doing that even though there is limited access now to the office because we still don't want um, teams of writers sitting in one meeting room together that's not, that's not good for people's health.